Hello and welcome to the Mormon Faircast, presented by Fair Mormon. I am your host, Nick Galetti. This episode's guests are Terrell and Fiona Givens. Terrell Givens holds the James A. Bostwick Chair of English and is the Professor of Literature and Religion at the University of Richmond and the author of several books. His writing has been praised by the New York Times as provocative reading and includes the most recent title, When Souls Had Wings, A History of the Idea of Premortal Life in Western Thought. Fiona Givens is a retired modern language teacher and undergra- with undergraduate degrees in French and German and a graduate degree in European history. She is now an independent scholar who has published in several journals and reviews in Mormon studies, including the Journal of Mormon History, Exponent 2, and LDS Living. Terrell and Fiona Givens are the grandparents of five and parents of six. Welcome, Terrell and Fiona Givens. Thank you for coming on. Oh, Thank you, Nick. For the uh, so uh, we we really do have so much to get into today, and and your book, of course, that we're here to talk about is Crucible of Doubt, recently released by Deseret Book, and but I wanted to see if we could just get right into the subject matter instead of talking about your history and things like that, because most people know who you are, at least in the LDS literature world. Um, so let's let's get right into it. You guys started out writing this book with two authors, or did one of you start it and then say, you know what, I'd really like to have you on with this? How did the What was the genesis of that writing effort? Well, the book really had its genesis in a letter to a doubter that I wrote to a family member a few years ago and then presented as a fireside. And when we saw the, the scope of the reaction and the resonance that some of those ideas had with a diverse audience, we decided that we would put our heads together and elaborate that letter into a full-length book. And we had uh, had a wonderful experience collaborating on our last joint venture, which was The God Who Weeps. Mm-hmm. And so we felt that we would try a joint uh, production again. We've, we've, we've come to learn that in our devotional work, our thoughts and uh, hearts and mind have become so intertwined that it's hard to know where one starts and the other begins. So it well, just makes sense to do these kinds of works together. Well, that was the next question I had was with these two different voices going. Sometimes you don't know who wrote what, but you're, you're making it sound like it was very uh, unified. You guys shared your words. Yeah, well, I tend to do most of the writing of the first draft, and then Fiona gives it a careful going over and makes usually extensive um, editing (laughs) suggestions and interpolations, which uh, usually are peacefully accommodated but well that's sometimes. good <laughs> well, yeah sometimes uh, there's some you know we have to come to the table it's a little bit like uh, the middle east talks on occasion <laughs> but um generally it's harmonious and quite frankly if 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 i weren't involved um it would be a pamphlet so it is my job to extrapolate you know to add um to to expound on certain things um that i feel terrell has left too succinctly written ah so too too economical. You 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 bring out yeah. more. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. so I guess I'm curious. Uh, there's a line in the introduction where someone says that they love Cadbury chocolate and dislike Adam Sandler movies. So who's that? Is that both of you? <laughs> it is actually both of us. I, I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of Cadbury chocolate. Very plebeian in my in my uh, chocolate taste. I mean, all these wonderful chocolates out there. But oh my goodness, I'm so at home with Cadburys. And neither of us really like Adam Sandler movies. <laughs> well, that's that's expected with your education. I'm sure it's a little little beneath your your usual <laughs> your usual viewing. So, so you you basically made it sound like this was a repeat performance. Then as a dual writing effort. So I take it that it was positive, and that that means there's something else in the future with both of your names on it. Uh, well, I don't know, Fiona. Sure. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, we, we are. <laughs> we may be um, talked out. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a question of uh, do we have something interesting or important to add to any other conversation? And we're not we're not sure that we do. We hope that the conversational additions um, to the fundamentals of the Mormon faith and also um, to this the, this idea of, of faith challenges um, are helpful, um, interesting, and provocative. Hopefully. But I'm um, not sure if there's anything else coming. Yeah. Well, I found it to be very successful. So 
I hope that that means that you guys have some encouragement that, uh, that it would be a successful venture in the future. Well, thank you. Again, this book is entitled The Crucible of Doubt, subtitled Reflections on the Quest for Faith. So you've written on having doubts. You, you talk about this, this presentation or fireside that you guys have done in the past regarding what some people have called a faith crisis. And, and so with that being said, do you guys consider yourselves doubt scholars or faith crisis <laughs> specialists? We, we certainly find that we are surrounded um, for the most part, by people who are um, experiencing challenges to his to their faith, um, that is true. Whether we um, that we are scholars on the subject is no, we are absolutely not. Okay. Um, but I think we've had enough conversations with people who are having challenges that we feel conversant um, with the language of faith crisis. And then, of course, Terrell and myself, we, we've had our own faith crises. Um, Terrell had a near drowning incident in Africa a number of years ago, and if he wants to go into that, he certainly may. But that was that was a um, a really significant shift in his paradigm, and um, and I, you know, I, I have too. I, I'm sort of, I think I have an ongoing faith crisis. It doesn't start and stop; it just continues um, at various frequencies. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I guess that means that you guys specifically p- chose the word crucible or essentially a trial of doubt. I mean, is that was that your choice then because of your experiences to go with that title? Well, I think we were both influenced by Dostoevsky, whom we both admire greatly. And in speaking of his own religious journey, he said, it's not like a child that I believe in Christ and profess faith in him but rather my Hosanna has come through the great crucible of doubt. And what, well, there are a few things we like about that quotation. One is that he talks about having come through the crucible of doubt. Mm-hmm. It's uh, similar to what Hubie Brown once said. He said, no man can claim to be a true disciple of Christ who has not passed an apprenticeship in doubt. Mm. So we, we believe that doubt can have a powerful and tremendously useful and productive function in one's faith journey. But it's something that we aspire to move through and beyond, not to wallow in endlessly. And then the idea of a crucible refines us of the scriptural imagery of a refiner's fire. So there's there's something to be said for the way in which a crucible tries you but ultimately can strengthen you. Excellent. That being said, um, there, there are people who have been born with the gift of faith or who have the gift of faith given to them. Um, and But for most people... Um, the only way to strengthen one's faith, as Terrell has said, is to actually have it challenged. Um, it, it, there, there are paradigm-shifting moments. It's, we're constantly told that testimonies are living things and, um, and that our, our spiritual, spirits are, um, are evolving and um, hopefully to the point where they're becoming more Christ-like. Um, that being said, that we, we are inevitably going to meet bumps along the road and that they shouldn't be um be obstacles which should be avoided but rather worked through and it's not the end of the world if you have one it's it's just part of the the faith journey for most people we think i was going to say part of what we're trying to respond to is what we think can be in at times oppressive culture of certainty in our tradition that we do not see as intrinsic to the gospel, but it has become uh, intrinsic to our culture. And many people feel marginalized and alienated if they can't participate in that language of certainty. And we think, as President Holland, or Elder Holland, for example, has recently expressed, that the scriptures clearly make room for those who cannot or cannot yet profess absolute knowledge, but desire to pursue their path of discipleship in the midst of their doubt. I, I, with all that being said, I, I wonder if, given the term faith crisis, if crisis is the right word, it's very scary when you call it a faith crisis. Well, well we're open to suggestions. <laughs> well, no, but, but quite honestly, for those experiencing severe challenges to their faith, um, most people experience it, we'll, we'll define it, we'll see it as crisis. Uh, because oftentimes it it comes unexpectedly, 
um, it, you, you, you don't see it coming and then suddenly you're in the midst of it. I, I think definitely those people who are experiencing challenges to their faith would consider themselves to be in some type of a crisis. So it comes more from the people experiencing it rather than the people observing it. Yes. Well, let's get to, more into your book. It's, it's again, called Crucible of De- The Crucible of Doubt. It is primarily a devotional text. Uh, there does seem to be an apologetic sub- subtext to it in that it helps the reader to reframe themselves with respect to LDS theology in such a way that questions are more answerable. Was, was that part of the intent in your writing, or did, did it just speak to me that way? No, I think that for a long time there has been an apologetic tradition in Mormonism that has emphasized giving factual or historical or cultural answers to very specific questions that can precipitate doubt. And we felt in part uh, prompted, I think, by our experience in Edinburgh in, in the John Knox house, we were prompted to consider that a different and sometimes more fruitful approach to faith challenges may be to reconsider the assumptions and the paradigms that get us into trouble to begin with. So that was our approach in this book. Well, let's actually get to the introduction uh, because it, it, it kind of sets up exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, I would say that some introductions to books are a little superfluous, uh, at times, but yours doesn't fit into that category. In fact, I would venture to say that if you skip over the introduction in the book, you'll miss a good bit of the remainder of the text. And your introduction starts out with this analogy using a lock. So and you kind of re- reference that a little bit. Why don't you kind of give that analogy and explain how that fits into this? When we were in Edinburgh, we went to see the John Knox house. It's called the John Knox house, quite frankly, just to attract tourists. But essentially, he didn't live there if for very long, if at all. It belonged to John James Mossman, who was a goldsmith to Mary, Queen of Scots. And um, naturally, he was a very wealthy man. And he kept most of his um, his gold. And uh, he was an artificer. He, he, he made her crown jewels um, in, in this room. And it was locked. And um, nobody was able to break into it. And it was quite extraordinary because when you look at the lock, you think, okay, there's the lock and you you try and pick it, but nobody can get into it at all Um, because the true lock is actually hidden under an ornamental piece. So if you move it to the side, um, that's where the lock is to the room. Um, The key, excuse me, the keyhole is to the room. But because it's so cleverly, the, the, the um, pieces are so cleverly worn together, that woven together, they look like one ornamental piece. Nobody would assume to move it. So um, that was sort of the genesis for this idea of sometimes we're asking the wrong questions. We're trying to get to the gold through the wrong keyhole. And, um, and we will never get answers to the questions if they're incorrect. If the questions are incorrect, correct. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we feel that it's, it's questions more than answers that really drive our faith. Um, but we are a faith tradition, um, unlike a, a number of Christian faith traditions who actually expect that God will answer our prayers. We're taught that he will answer our prayers. And so it's incredibly frustrating when you are answering uh, when you were asking really urgent questions and you're just greeted with silence. And it's like, suddenly, what am I doing wrong? Why has God abandoned me? When in actual fact, he may not be able to answer the question in the way we are asking it because we are asking for a prescribed answer. We're asking, we're asking for an answer on our terms rather than God's terms. Mm which gives him no room to move. So what are, what are some of those common wrong questions that people encounter, especially today? Well, I think wrong questions more often take the form of wrong assumptions under liar questions. For example, we may often grow very disillusioned and very frustrated when we think that the prophet has erred or has disappointed us, that we learn in studying the life of Joseph or other prophetic figures, that their lives don't measure up to the stories and uh, lessons that we learned in primary. 
And so in this case, the assumption has to do with the nature of prophetic fallibility. And uh, we believe that the scriptures are replete. Joseph's own words were replete with allusions to his flaws and failings. Section 124, verse 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants is a fairly remarkable scripture in that it tells us that the Lord chose Joseph not because of his gifts and strengths, but on the contrary, because of his very weakness, so that he could show forth his own power through a fallible instrument. So that's an example of a paradigm that we try to realign in such a way as to eliminate the problem of unrealistic expectations that we impose upon our leadership. Hmm. Excellent. And and in in addition to that, um, we also have wrong expectations of our religion. Um, I think everybody um, assumes. Well, Marx said that religion was the opiate of the people, but a lot of people want to turn religion into an opiate. They want to find some type of peace in their religious faith tradition, where in actual fact, it's it's not to be found there. And um, I think a really good example of this is in John 6. Um, Christ has spoken some really um, uncomfortable things, um, that so much so that his, he, he frightens uh, his disciples. And many of them choose at that point that they're going to leave, that this is something they can't stomach. And, so, and then Christ turns to his apostles, and the question is, will you go also? The answer is so intriguing because they don't say, oh, no, um, we've got it all figured out. We're, we're cool with you. Um, we're not scared. Um, this, is, this is great. Uh, they don't say any of those things. <laughs> they're, they're as terrified as everybody else. It's like, my goodness, who is this man and what on earth is he saying? Um, but it's essentially we have thrown our lot in with you. So to, to whom else are we going to go? Um, you know, we, we, we feel, believe strongly and hope sincerely that you are the Messiah, the promised one. But you can really feel that wrenching in the question and in the answer. And, um, and all through the New Testament, you have this idea that, you know, Christ has not come with a faith tradition that is going to grant instantaneous peace to all those who join it. On the contrary, and, and, and this is a personal example, when I joined the church, it came at the cost of my family. Um, so that idea of uh, he, will, um, he has come to put a man at variance against his father was very re- is very real to me. Um, and so, I, and I think I think that's a huge, huge issue where we think that the that our religion is supposed to answer all our questions and make us feel good um, about different things in our lives. When in in fact it doesn't. I love Flannery O'Connor's comment on it. Um, she says religion costs. They think faith is a big electric blanket when, of course, it's a cross. And we forget that I think a lot of times because our particular faith tradition has so many programs. It's like. We have a prescription for every ailment that occurs within the church. And there has been some concern um, expressed by the leaders that we've actually over-prescriptioned the church. We've got too many programs. We are too heavy laden. Right. And, um, and, and I think that's very, very true. And so it sets up, again, this expectation that, okay, I have this problem, therefore there sh- a program should be put in place to answer it to resolve me of the ambiguities and what Terrell was saying of actually wrestling with this problem myself and and finding answers on my own or with other community members to resolve whatever issue has arrived. Yeah. Well, and this cognitive dissonance feeds a spiritual dissonance. When when things don't match up, it, it ends up affecting people's spirituality. And Absolutely. So it, the, the book continues, actually, to go in the next chapters to talk about the value of reason. Or, in another sense, the place of scientific information is the foundation upon which reason is based. So your argument sounds a little like, uh, when I was reading it, I was like, boy, this sounds like a literature professor seeking to give more weight to their subject uh, <laughs> as opposed to science. So, But maybe you could talk about this idea of appraising reason and using art and things like that with respect to solving these doubt questions or putting on a new paradigm. Well, you know, 
the problem is we, we are great admirers of science. I mean, I am personally, our culture is today, and we should be. Science has, has, has pioneered incredible new frontiers, and it's been the spearhead of technological innovation and enhanced standard of living. The problem is when we come to think that science or rationality are the only or the necessarily superior avenues to ultimate truth and knowledge. And a little bit of reflection indicates that in our actual lived experience, that's never the case. We don't rely upon logic or rationalism or science for those decisions of greatest importance and moment in our own lives. We don't shape our moral responses on the basis of reason. We don't say, for example, that rape or child abuse is wrong because of some calculus of cost benefits. We intuitively, instinctively respond on the basis of moral intuition to those realities as well we should. And so our point is, why in religion should we not also credit other ways of knowing? Art is another means that uh, we give some examples of, of how art can be much more powerful and effective in revealing and conveying truth than any cold analysis of facts. Um, in fact, you know, perhaps the greatest scientist of all time, Einstein, once said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind its faithful servant. But we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And all we're trying to do is, is help in this work of rehabilitating the gift of intuition and spiritual discernment alongside of science and rationalism. So it's the tempering of that knowledge with the, the spiritual or personal uh, intuition that you talk about. So it's, it's a tempering of that information and putting it in, in, in a proper place. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't think that either unfettered reason or unfettered emotion is a safe avenue to pursue. Excellent. Well, let's talk for a minute about the role of suffering. This this goes into the next chapter a little bit, and you talk about how suffering has changed, perhaps, in its utility over the years with respect to discipleship. Well, I think um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who is probably the, the expert, at least in the uh, last century, on this idea, and he talks about grace, um, and, and he talks about this idea of cheap grace, about cheap grace being the moral enemy of the church. And then he continues by saying that a version of cheap grace is baptism without the discipline of community. Um, Edward Beecher was the same, had the same view in mind when he said that there is this discipline of suffering. In fact, he actually says that that's why Satan is follows followers refused to uh, follow the plan of salvation outlined by God because it entailed a discipline of suffering, horrific suffering for many, many people. But it's, it's, it's so interesting that Christ, in his admonition to us to follow him, is pick up your cross and follow me. I think that's nicely put. Fiona has said in another context that we we too often say where was god in that tragedy when the question should be where were we in response to that tragedy i think the other point we're trying to make is that suffering has to be embraced as the cost of living in a tragic universe where the good often has to suffer in opposition to another good and we think that that's the lesson that even latter-day saints haven't often imbibed from the story of the garden of eden where Eve is not confronted with a simple choice between good and evil, as other Christians believe, but we see her as confronted with a choice between good and good. That's, that's the nature of the universe in which we live. Yeah. So, again, the role between suffering and doubt. Uh, is this because the person that's in doubt should suffer? Is that the stew in it, essentially? No, no, that's not it at all. But I think our, our faith tradition is so optimistic. Uh, it's optimistic in a number of areas which um, have actually um, added to the problem of faith challenges because a lot of the responses and, and really uh, our hope is that those people who haven't had challenges to their faith and won't have challenges to faith, that, that a greater empathy might be created for them 
for those who do, um, it's not a question of this is something you need to stew in and enjoy it. That's, that's not it at all. We are fellow travelers. Tragedy hits our life, whether it, it comes in the, um, in the guise of face suffering or not. But it's how do we as a community um, and as individuals respond to suffering um, and, and that, that is the key thing, is that we are all going to suffer in some point or another. Uh, it's the nature of the universe. It's, it's the nature of the world in, in which we walk. So our idea is to embrace. We embrace each other in this, um, in this conflict, um, in this suffering that we find ourselves in, and, and help each other move forward. In, in that way, I think we can become a saviors on Mount Zion. We often think, and I think correctly so, um, that saviors on, on Mount Zion usually are, is um, associated with temple work. Absolutely. But I, th- but I think that, well, both Terrell and, I, and myself think very strongly, believe very strongly that we can also help each other and along this very difficult path of mortality. And in that regard, we are also um, walking with the Savior and, and can therefore become saviors in Mount Zion in that regard. It, it's the position of some today that questioning certain teachings or even publicly advocating for things that, that shake up the norm is the act of an apostate, where, while others praise their actions as bringing people to a higher plane of Christianity through that advocacy. In the next chapter of your book, uh, entitled On Provocation and Peace of Life's Fundamental Incompleteness, it deals with this question. So what then is the role of questioning or even experiencing a gospel that shakes us to our very core and, and having to ride that line between legitimate apostasy versus re-examining Christianity and, and Mormonism? Well, I think in many ways asking questions and advocating strongly for a, a change or a particular point of view are opposites. One reflects openness and searching and the other represents a kind of self-certainty. And the, the, the restoration, of course, begins with Joseph understanding the Lord to be telling him through the scriptures to ask the tough questions. And I can't find anything among Joseph Smith's many pronouncements or scriptural writings that would do anything to dissuade us from asking the toughest questions we're capable of asking. Brigham Young himself once said that his greatest fear would be that people would stop asking the hard questions, would just subject themselves to a kind of mindless, blind obedience. There's no such thing as a blind obedience that is righteous obedience. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that we go off half-cocked, convinced that our particular solutions that we have found to our questions are the ones that we should impose on the church or anyone else. Uh, I'm I'm mindful of the fact that that there persists a myth in the church that the brethren have said when when the brethren speak, the thinking is done. In actual fact, that sentiment was published in a church magazine, which when the prophet of the church learned of, he immediately and fiercely repudiated. Well, so there's a, there's a progression in the material of your book, and as you address these various paradigms that some have developed, uh, one of them is the use and abuse of scripture, uh, the perils of hero worship. Uh, another chapter is Mormons and Monopolies. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave those sections as a tease <laughs> Uh, to get people interested in the book, but there is a chapter that I wanted to to kind of end with, if you will. Uh, it's called Spiritual Self-Sufficiency, uh, subtitled Find Your Watering Place. What does spiritual self-sufficiency look like? Well, uh, Terrell and I have read, as many others have read very widely, uh, We there are faith traditions out there that are ancient, that are rich uh, with with beautiful truths. I, I think it's really important that we remember that our founding fathers acknowledged that Joseph did not restore truth to the earth. Um, he was very clear in saying that his job was to restore priesthood and priesthood keys, but that it was our job to go out into the world and search for truth and bring it back to Zion. In fact, he listed several um, religions and said, you know, if, 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 if you, you study all of these, um, 
you you will become you will come out a good Mormon. So this idea of searching not only other languages, cultures, but faith traditions was a very, very important part of the founding father's view for the progression of our faith. And so Terrell and I have done that. We have favorite authors, favorite poets, um, favorite devotional writers, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, I've mentioned before, of course, C.S. Lewis, George MacDonald, we both love Edward Beecher. And I, quite frankly, in, in the writings of women, Elizabeth Gaskell, um, Virginia Woolf, um, many truths that have, that have um, filled my reservoirs and and I think it's a really important responsibility that, I mean, some people say you are responsible for your own salvation. I find that too clinical and a little off-putting. But if we were to see it more as filling your reservoirs, filling your mind and heart with, with beautiful, uplifting, edifying, and educational um, literature, poetry, art, music that um, we become closer to Christ and um, actually develop a much greater empathy and understanding for other people's cultures and faith traditions in strengthening ourselves simultaneously. Did you have to add to that, Sarah? No, just that what we're saying is that each person needs to be more responsible for their own spiritual nourishment. We can't look to church or church services. That's not what they were ever intended to do. The Old and New Testament both use the term worship very clearly to indicate an offering that we make at great personal price, not a gift that we go in search of. And so we go to church to serve and to offer, uh, to make an offering to God. But the spiritual nourishment that we need to keep our faith and testimonies growing is uh, is a personal responsibility that, as Fiona has, has so nicely said, is something that we need to be responsible for by pursuing those sources of those fonts of inspiration that are most effective and powerful in nourishing our own souls. Well, I, I want to conclude with this quote from your book. It's kind of an articulation of just what might be at the heart of true faith, and that is the risk that it presents. Here's the quote. The question may remain, how does one lock onto the propositional assertions of a restored gospel that is also laden with claims about gold plates and the book of Abraham and a male priesthood and a polygamous past and a thousand other details we might may find difficult. One might consider that the contingencies of history and culture and the human element will always construe the garment in which God's word and will are clothed. And one might refuse to allow our desire for the perfect to be the enemy of the present good. Finally, we might ask ourselves with the early disciples, to whom else shall we go? The worst risk such a life of faith entails is not that such a life may be wrong, but that it might be incomprehensible to those unprepared to take such a risk. It then goes on to assert that to be a faithful Christian or disciple, uh, that that is to live in faith, is to live in such a way that one's life would not make sense if God did not exist. So I love that idea, but I, I wanted to give you a chance to articulate if there's any other thing that needs to be added about the risk that people sometimes might be afraid of when they come to doubt, when they come upon questions, what is that risk that people fear? Well, I think people have a great fear of being wrong. They have a fear of being a dupe. And <clears throat> I share that fear too. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be gullible in my own eyes or anyone else's. The question, it seems to us, is, is your love of truth and your yearning for truth greater than your fear of being wrong? And if it is then in that quest for truth, you need to be willing to take a risk. And also, I I would like to add that there is a risk in the questions that we do ask. Um, We're making ourselves vulnerable. But I think also, um, and I think as in everything, the Savior is, is the model here. When we look at the Garden of Gethsemane treatment by Luke, um, Christ looks at what's in front of him and... You know, he he realizes the horror um, that it entails, and he doesn't want to go there. And so he asks God to please make a way for him to escape. But God can't do that. He can't 
take the cup. There are billions of people who, whose salvations rely on this this particular um, event by this particular man um, who cannot be replaced. And what Christ does then is that that famous um, not as my will but as thou wilt be done we tend to breeze over that but what is what Christ is actually saying in there is I understand that you may not be able to take this away but please give me a way to be able to endure it so he's saying can you answer he gives God room to answer his question in another way and God is able to do that God then sends an angel who comforts and supports the Savior through his agony. And I think that is the risk that we have to do. We have to open ourselves out to the myriad ways God may actually respond to our question. He may not be able to take that cancer away. That may be something he is not able to do. So in our in our questing, then there is this trust element that God will somehow answer our question in another way, help us to be able to go through this. That is great, shows great risk, but I think it also shows that God is trying to talk to us in numerous voices. He is trying to help us see his handprint in various parts of our lives. So by not requiring God to answer us in the way we expect him to answer we are more likely to receive answers to our questions in in beautiful, miraculous, and God-touched ways. Well, Terrell and Fiona Givens are the co-authors of The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest for Faith. It's available now through Deseret Book at deseretbook.com, as well as other LDS retailers. Thank you both for coming on. Thank Thanks. you so much Perhaps. indeed, Nick. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mormon Faircast, brought to you by Fair Mormon. For more information, go to fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes under the name Mormon Faircast.